from the TOS guy. And today we have a really special guest. We have Dr. Fareed Garagoslu, who is an excellent surgeon in Florida, in Orlando, Florida. Not only does he have experience doing standard TOS surgery, but he has developed a whole new field of TOS surgery using robotics. He's on the cutting edge of this, and I'd like to welcome everybody to Dr. Fareed Garagoslu. Well, thank you, Dr. Werdan, um, and uh, it's a privilege to join everyone in this uh, uh, presentation and uh, discussion about TOS. Um, I will try to take everybody through a journey of discovery that really started about maybe 20 some years ago and uh, hope that uh, it will pr slowly clarify some of our new thinking about this disease. Um, the important thing is that for many, many years, since the really the 50s especially, we have thought that this disease is because something is compressing a structure in the, in the neck and the thoracic outlet area. And uh, the, the compression has been thought to be a physical compression like of a nerve most uh, commonly. We are now understanding that many times the patients who have these symptoms, and I'll go through it, actually have uh, trouble with blood flow. And, uh, and the reason that they're having a lot of the nerve symptoms probably is because of a change in blood flow to the extremity as opposed to a compression of a nerve. That is the sort of the overall kind of approach to this that we're taking. And I'll kind of take the, our audience through this uh, slowly to understand the, how we have come to this conclusion. The important thing is that Unfortunately, medical practitioners underestimate this disease. This is a common disease. It is highly underdiagnosed. I call it the, the three-headed chameleon because it really is a disease that can present with nerve symptoms, most commonly about 95% of the time. But unfortunately, 98% of that 95% have no specific objective finding, and we call them disputed neurogenic TOS. We're going to talk about that. I think we're also going to talk about how we need to change some of our terminology because neurogenic means that it is caused by nerves and probably nerve symptoms is a more uh, accurate way of talking about symptoms in those patients. There are a very few patients who have trouble with the artery in the thoracic outlet area and then another group of three to five percent of the patients who have trouble with compression of the vein, that actually is the most, the easiest one to understand and diagnose. As you'll see, we started with that in our journey. Uh, the key is this is a disease of young people and young females. And this is really important because unfortunately in our culture, we, when someone comes and talks about pain uh, and uh, they're talking about pain in a way that physicians cannot understand from physical diagnosis standpoint, then we start talking about histrionic personality, we start labeling people, we start giving them pain medicines, on and on and on. And really we do a disservice just because we are not understanding what's really going on. So this is a fascinating disease and let's go on this journey together. Everyone pretty much knows that this chameleon presents with pain numbness, tingling, weakness, fatigue. People can have headaches and they can be swelling of the extremity, many different ways of presentation. And for centuries now, people have tried to understand what in the world is going on when these patients have so many different and complex symptoms. Unfortunately, sometimes in medicine, when we try to sort of outsmart ourselves we really do end up outsmarting ourselves in a very negative way. And this goes back to 1956 when a physical therapist at Mayo Clinic wrote a paper trying to make sense out of patients who were presenting with different types of symptoms that had to do with the thoracic outlet. This paper started a, a, a whole slew of, of uh, really uh, misunderstanding about this disease. So it's been six decades since that paper was published. That's the paper that said there is neurogenic, venous, arterial TOS. And that paper, which really wasn't meant to do that, I don't think Dr. Pete or Mr. Pete or any of his colleagues ever wanted to do that. It caused confusion among practitioners to this very day, difficulty in making the diagnosis, 
and really very poor results with surgery to the extent that most surgeons uh, do everything possible not to operate on patients who may have TLF. Most importantly, if the purpose of unifying a group of patients with neurovascular symptoms of the extremity was to understand it better and improve therapeutics, well, our experience of the last six decades shows that that effort has fallen flat on its face. So we have really done a disservice to this disease by keeping going, keep, we keep going back to six decades ago to the lack of understanding that started all with the PEEP paper. Unfortunately, for the last six decades, we have talked about compression of something in the thoracic outlet. It's like this is, this is sort of the, this, this nebulous point that, that there is something being compressed between the first rib and other structures whether it is a pectoralis muscle uh, 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 or, or a costal uh, coracoid ligament or scalenous muscle, on and on and on. And to be frank, if that was the right th understanding, our results would be so much better. And the results are horrible because that is not the, under the true nature. That is, our concepts are flawed. And I think most surgeons or people who are in this field would say that really we feel very uncomfortable. We don't want to do things uh, based on this sort of a half understanding of a disease because then you end up with half good results. So back about two decades ago, as one of the surgeons dealing with this disease and very frustrated with the results and understanding, et cetera, et cetera, this is just really, there's a great deal of intellectual dissatisfaction when you're dealing with this disease. We began with a clean sheet approach, getting rid of all of the previous understanding and trying to understand it because we had a lot of patients. And if that's really the laboratory of the highest order to have patients who can show you this disease and you don't come in with preconceived notions of it. We began with the Paget-Schroeder or venous TOS. That is the easy one because that is the vein that's compressed. The patient's symptoms are obvious. Their arm is blue, it's swollen. And we really have a pretty good understanding of this disease because it's uh, the vein is clotted in the upper extremity. We put patients on blood thinners and then we take out their first rib and the results are have been reasonable. Not perfect, but reasonable. This was worked out uh, and mostly at UCLA and some other great institutions. But so we started with these because that was the low hanging fruit. But what we found is when we remove the first rib on these patients and you compare the first rib to the first rib of a normal patient, you find that there is something different in the head of the rib. The sternum would be here. This is where the subclavian vein would cross as the first rib. This is a normal first rib. This is a first rib segment from a patient with Paget Schroeder. There's a tubercle. So we found that there is something abnormal with the first rib of these patients. This is not something pressing the vein. This is the first rib that is congenitally abnormal. We, we wrote this paper back in 2012 after extensive experience. And, and so we turned the disease that was a syndrome, which means you don't know the cause of it, to Paget Schroeder disease, which means that you know what's causing the problem. That tubercle of the bone, abnormally developed bone, compresses the, uh, the, the vein. Now, this is a, a similar paper uh, looking at a larger experience of these patients. But the bottom line is that we find that there was a congenitally malformed aspect of the first rib as it connected with the sternum. And that pony tubercle uh, caused compression of the vein. The vein was draped over it because normally there's a trough in the first rib and the vein sits in it, so it's not compressed. But when the patient elevates their arm over the shoulder, that compression basically closes off the, the vein. And that's important. This is a venogram, injection of the dye you can see right here. And the arm is elevated over the shoulder. This is the left side. Here's the first rib, and basically the, the, there's no flow. This is uh, happening because of an abnormal bone. Here's a patient who obviously has collaterals on the right side. You can see that with the arms down, there is clot here. This is a Paget-Schroeder patient. 
I want you to look at the other side as well. Now, when you look at this, you kind of get a little impression of a little bit, so like somebody took a bite out of it. And this vein is not as large as the others. So we were concerned that maybe because this is a congenital disease, if it's congenital, it needs to be both sides. Now look at this one. The arms are elevated, and this is the disease side. On the contralateral side, when they elevate their arm, no more flow. And this explains why this disease is seen in people who work over their shoulders or repetitive motion over the shoulder. So the baseball player, the auto mechanic, somebody who sleeps with their arm over their uh, uh, shoulder and under their head, and they wake up with a swollen arm. This Paget Schroeder disease basically is coming from a congenital abnormality of both sides. It will show up in the on the dominant side, obviously, because that's the side the person is using. This was called effort thrombosis some time ago. But so the key point of this is this is a bony disease, it's congenital, and it's both sides. And this explains why patients who get one side operated on will, in a certain percentage, will come back with the other side. So there is now movement to doing a, a preventive operation uh, to make sure that the vein doesn't clot. Once the vein clots, you're dealing with a very different problem than just compressing it. The venogram is, is a more complicated procedure. So in the in about 10 years ago, we started working on um, uh, easier ways of diagnosing with less invasiveness. This is an MR, magnetic resin angiogram. And I got to give a plug to Dr. Verdan and all his experience. So he has really put this on the map. But this is some study we did it when I was at University of Arizona. Uh, and you can see this is very early MR. But here's a patient. The, this is the left side. You can see the compression of the vein from the outside by the bony tubercle very easily as they're elevating and the vein clot, uh, closes and you can see how that'll clot easily. This is a resected specimen. And the interesting thing about this is that this part of the bone that we are interested in, in our experience, when we had done this surgery by going under the armpit or or over the neck in the supraclavicular area, we would cut the bone right here. This portion needs to be disarticulated. That means this is a joint formed between this bone and the sternum, and you have to dis uh, the disconnect the joint, which is rarely done. And so most surgeons would cut it right here. And then it dawned on us that actually, if you cut the bone here, you're actually leaving the disease behind. You may decrease the compression somewhat, but not totally. And we'll get to that in a minute, but here is a three-dimensional reconstruction on CT scans of the abnormal area. This is a first rib. This should not be there. That is the bony tubercle. And this shows you that, that this is a, uh, there's a variety of different processes, but when there's disease as the costal uh, sternal joint, this is the bone, of the first rib, this is the sternum. This, you can imagine how this will compress the subclavian vein as it drapes over it. And, and really taking that out is impossible going from under the armpit or over the uh, clavicle. So we decided that with this new technology of robotics, we may be able to go from the inside to disconnect. So, and this wasn't some, some new discovery because my predecessors and in fact, some of my um, uh, uh, teachers at the Mayo Clinic had done fantastic work by opening people's chests and removing that uh, joint and the first rib with excellent results. The problem is if you're gonna open somebody's chest, uh, that's almost a disease unto itself. So that even though it was successful, it was really not very well tolerated. So it kind of went off in, in the sunset of history. But we thought, well, we have a new technology called robotics. We can go with three little holes into the chest and do what they used to do with opening the chest. And so by doing that, this is a paper from around 2012 where we first described it. And uh, this is another one in 2012. And this really has now become the operation of choice if you know how to do robotics, because, uh, and I'll show you the results, the results we have gotten with this 
better understanding combined with the robotic approach is the best ever published in the history of this, uh, the, uh, the Paget Schroeder disease. This is a paper from 2019 with the largest series in the world. And this is a presentation from the Society of Thoracic Surgery 2018, just for example, this is 83 patients. Um, and you can see this, this is done with the robot. In about two hours, you do the surgery. They do stay in the hospital longer because the holes in the chest hurt more than making a skin incision on the neck. No complications and most importantly, no neurovascular injury. There is a significant complication rate with uh, uh, injury to the nerves if we, in the patients uh, that are done by either going under the armpit or over the uh, clavicle. So this is a huge change. Uh, and But more importantly, if you look at these patients, um, so about 70% had a vein that was open. They have to stay on three months of, of blood thinners and that's it. Then they're good. In about a quarter of the patients, they needed that vein stretched. And again, after three months of blood thinners and 7% a stent was placed because this the vein was very fibrotic. That's really not important. The important thing is that they were, once the bone is removed, you can open that vein. At 24 month follow-up, all of the patients had an open vein and a normal extremity. That is the best results with TOS, with this type of TOS, the venous TOS ever reported. And people become, have a normal life. Here it is, this is preoperatively, this is on a venogram, you can see the vein is occluded. Here's a venogram postoperatively, totally open. So they get their arm back. And this is on a, an MR study, you can see the same thing before the removal of the bone to the, af uh, the uh, afterwards. Now, once we understood that the venous TOS is caused by this bony abnormality of the first rib, then we, we got a little bit braver to look at the, the, the main uh, event, which is uh, the patients with what has been called neurogenic TOS. Now, Patients with neurogen nerve symptoms can have it for various things. And unfortunately, if you study the history of this disease, you find that uh, the, the low hanging fruit with neurogenic patients are the cervical rib patients, because that's easy. You get an x-ray and you can see the cervical rib. Only 2% of the patients have a cervical rib. But if you talk to practitioners or uh, uh, the physician, they go right to that as if that's the most common thing. And so the point is that's, that's easy to diagnose. The problem is in the 98% of these that are called disputed neurogenic TOS, which means the reason it's disputed is there is no objective evidence. They get nerve conduction studies, they get exams, et cetera, et cetera. All these things like AdSense tests, rights tests, these are equivocal. They are not diagnosed. So over the years, surgery, has been used as a diagnostic modality for these patients with disputed TOS. So if you you so if nothing else can be done, you do surgery. If they get better, ah, they had TOS. If they didn't get better, tough. That is not the way surgery should be done. You, good surgery goes after specific diagnosis. So the question was, what is going on with these people who have disputed TOS? This is a significant index case. So as we were sort of struggling with this about 10, 12 years ago, a patient came to see me uh, who had had surgery at a very prominent institution by a very famous uh, TOS surgeon who had done a beautiful first rib resection. You can see on this chest X-ray, the rib is not there. Here's the other side, this is the first rib. So you look at this and you say, wow, well, the first rib was removed. The patient's like, you know, I got like 10% relief. I'm not, I'm not any better. And the surgeon, like others would swear to God, they took out the rib. Here is the specimen, everything. But I want you to understand that the, the, if the symptoms don't get better, whether you take the rib out or not, that's not the point. The point is something is wrong. This is when we first had the robot. So in this patient on an IRB protocol, we decided to look in the chest to see maybe we saw better, uh, uh, this is a very difficult area to see from with x-rays and CTs and MRs and stuff. So 
The interesting thing is that when a venogram was obtained in that patient who had the rib removed, the vein was compressed. Now, this is a neurogenic patient. This is a patient with nerve symptoms, uh, and the vein is compressed. Now, this is an odd thing because everybody is thinking the reason they have nerve problems is because the nerve is being compressed. But I have news for you. The, the brachial plexus is nowhere close to the first rib. So for all these years, no one has said the, ki the king has no clothes on. When we're talking about, oh, we are going to do something to the brachial plexus by removing the first rib. You don't do anything to the brachial plexus. So, so the issue is we kind of close our eyes and, and sort of go with it. Unfortunately, that's human nature. And so it's time to say the king has no clothes on. So here it is. This guy has nerve symptoms, but his vein is compressed. You can see it on the MR. You can see it on the venogram. And this is the way it looks from the with the robot from the inside. And the arrow, the arrow area is, is what we're going to concentrate on. So frankly, if you look at this, it doesn't look abnormal at all. But if you dissect it, separate the tissues, this is, by the way, the robot instrument. This is an eight millimeter instrument. So it shows you this is a very small space. You all of a sudden see that this is where the surgeon had cut the bone. The surgeon cut it, took out that piece of the bone, and this piece, which is the joint with the sternum, what we call the costosternal joint, is in place. So we remove this with a robot. This is what it looks like. This is a tiny piece of bone, but the venogram tells the story. It was compressing the pore of the vein here. And the amazing thing is that the patient's symptoms went away. This index case made us start thinking that maybe patients who present with nerve symptoms of the upper extremity don't have to have their nerves compressed. And maybe that's why the nerve conduction studies are normal in the majority of patients. This combined with a, a fascinating discussion I had with a young lady who had nerve symptoms and I was asking her to tell me about her symptoms. And at one point she said, you know, I don't know how to describe my symptoms. It feels like my arm is falling asleep, like my leg falls asleep. And that's when the light goes off in your head if you're really listening, because then you say, what makes your leg falls, fall asleep when you cross your leg? And how could that be related to, to the upper extremity? And if you think about that, when you cross your leg, everybody knows what it feels like. It's when you're compressing the vein that's draining the bottom part of your leg between your uh, right on top of your knee. So when the vein is compressed, it turns out that the pressure of the vein in the nerve sheath goes up and that decreases the blood flow to the nerve. And that's why your leg falls asleep. And the longer you hold your leg crossed, the less blood flow and the worse the symptoms. So everybody knows if you keep it like that, you're gonna to get to a point where you go from tingling to when your leg just feels like it's somebody else's. And, and, and then you uncross it and things get better. And so the question was, is this what's going on in a certain group of patients with thoracic outlet syndrome who have nerve symptoms? And maybe in those patients, what's happening is something is compressing this vein because the subclavian vein is very similar to the vein in the leg. It, these two structures, they have one artery that flows and one vein that drains. So if the vein is compressed, the venous pressure goes up in the nerve sheath, and maybe that's why these patients have difficulty explaining their symptoms because their symptoms are variable, and it depends really on what they're doing and so forth. So that was the hypothesis for going forward. The important, I'm going to leave that for a second. We're going to come to that, but let me get to, to the, the, the why the robot has helped us understand this disease a little bit, because it's not about the technology of doing the surgery, but it's like a new vista to this disease. Imagine if you could look inside the chest with a one centimeter uh, uh, camera that has 20 times magnification and three-dimensional high resolution, all of a sudden it's like somebody opened your eyes. And the issue is we found that in our previous operations, we had not disarticulated the joint. 
Some surgeons do, they get better results, but most surgeons don't. And the key is the disarticulation, that's one. The second point is that it is hard to disarticulate by going under the armpit or over the neck. However, giants in this field, Dr. Hal Urchel, Dr. Claggett, these guys understood that if you don't disarticulate, the patient doesn't get better. And I, when I trained with these uh, guys, uh, I can tell you that that kind of stuck with me for all my career because they had the best results and nobody believed their results because everybody else is having poor results. But of course, they were being very invasive with their surgery. This is, goes back many, many years. So the issue is that the disarticulation is key. You probably don't need to remove the whole rib because the disease is on the middle side, medial side, not the back where all the nerves are. So by taking out part of the rib instead of all the rib, you decrease the nerve the complications because the nerves are in the back of the rib. And this gave us a new vista to this disease. So the hypothesis was that this is really a problem with in not every patient. And the key is we'll talk about how you get to sort of clear the waters, but in a significant number of patients who present with nerve symptoms of the upper extremity, which we would call the TOS, uh, they would have venous hypertension. Now, the, and a lot of papers have been written actually about the blood nerve barrier in the nerve root and how if you basically have venous congestion, you, you decrease the flow of the blood from the artery and the vein becomes, uh, uh, because of the low blood flow becomes ischemic or, and it's unhappy and it's very much like crossing your leg. So venous ischemia and congestion of the upper extremity and not something like compressing, like the tendon or et cetera, et cetera. So here's a rib from a patient with neurogenic TOS. Again, very similar in its, uh, the way it looks to the patient with Paget Schroeder. So the next point that of our discovery was that not everybody, but a lot of the patients with neurogenic and Paget Schroeder are really the same pathology presenting itself in a variable symptom uh, set. So if the patient, in normally the blood flow is decreased, they'll have nerve pain. In fact, we have studied these patients by taking the Paget Schroeder patient and asking them about symptoms they may have had before their arm clotted. They all had nerve symptoms. They kind of blow them all off and didn't do anything about it. But it turns out that they have symptoms. Now, if you hold your arm up too high, the flow gets less and then it'll clot. So this is a variable expression of the same disease. So venous TOS and a group of neurogenic patients are probably the same pathology underlying the nerve disease. And we have uh, written this. Uh, and uh, really now the point is that the compression of the vein and the results in a spectrum of disease it ranges from neurologic symptoms, uh, from venous ischemia, and if you keep it going too long, the vein clots, and then you end up with what we call Paget Schroeder. And uh, we have then published uh, the largest series of these patients with neurogenic symptoms now, removal of the that portion of the first rib, not the whole rib again, um, uh, by robot, and. Uh, this basically, we look back at these patients that had the surgery to see the results. And they got a subjective symptom relief questionnaire that's called a quick dash, a physical exam, an MRA with maneuvers where they get a study to look at it. And immediately, at, at this was all this was done one month and six months. And this is a, in a group of 79 patients. Again, this is relatively young patients. This is a young person's disease. And as I said, mostly young women. And the subclavian vein compression was seen in all of these patients. Um, and that's, if you don't see the compression, we would not offer them the operation. So this is important that we are, we're not saying that everybody has this, but if they have it, the surgery will be successful. That's the message. The operative time, actually, we got better over the years. Remember, the others were about two hours. This is about an hour and a half. We got better with their pain control. 
no complications in terms of surgical neurovascular injuries or deaths. And the key is if you look at the quick dash, which is a disability score of the arm, shoulder, and hand questionnaire, before surgery, their score is 52. They're, they're not happy campers. The total score is 55. So they're, they're not in good shape. Immediately post-surgery, they go down to five. So this is a significant difference. That's statistically significant. And then at six months, they even get better. And this is important because this is evident for the fact that as the blood flow gets better, their symptoms actually get better. It's just like when you first uncross your leg, you may have some symptoms, but you walk around and then it all goes away. And it's the same thing. So this actually uh, is more evidence to the fact that there is venous compression in these patients. And if you look at the relief of symptoms, immediately after surgery, 91% have relief. This is the best results you can have with TOS, at least published today. Immediately after surgery, though, some people have paresthesia. And again, this goes along with the, vein, the nerve recovering uh, as the blood flow gets better. And the key is that um, it is in, this tells us that we should intervene early Patients who are like 60 years old who have had 20 years of symptoms, they may continue with symptoms because the nerve may not come back. But if you do this in a younger patient who has had symptoms for a shorter time, they get better. So really the key is they get very good relief after a period of time. All of them are better. This is the best results published to date as far as I know. So. I think that for people who are interested in this disease, I, I, I'm going to put a plug in for Dr. Verdan because uh, he has taught me a lot. And we have no uh, relationship other than the intellectual aspects of this disease. But he, his website actually has been a great source of understanding the history of this disease. I think people need to know where we've been to know where we're going to go. So I suggest that anyone who's interested in this disease study the history because you'll see that the history actually is one of the causes of the derailment of our understanding of this disease. And we presently, based on our understanding, we are presenting TOS and classification differently than Pete and what's, what you'll read on Google Doc and so forth. Cervical rib disease, is compression of the brachial plexus and, and it, various bands in the neck, et cetera, something going on in the neck that compresses uh, the, so the brachial plexus. It can be because of bone, it can be because of uh, uh, fibrous bands, et cetera, et cetera, abnormalities. Those patients are different than TOS and they should be called cervical rib disease. On the other hand, the patients who have venous compression uh, and this is a lot of the patients with nerve symptoms and all the patients with uh, the vein symptom, they should be classified in our view as subclavian vein compression syndrome because that actually means something. And the point of classifying disease is to find, to understand it and then also understand what intervention you should do. So when I tell you subclavian vein compression, if you decrease the compression by opening the vein, with various things that we've talked about, that makes sense. Or cervical rib disease, and it should really be cervical rib bands, et cetera, disease. That's that you go in the neck and you deal with it. This, in my view, is a better classification of this disease than TOS and neurogenic, et cetera, et cetera. In going further, we think that patients with neurologic symptoms, not neurogenic, that's not the, the right term. The right English is neurologic symptoms. Majority, as we know, are disputed TOSs. And then those patients, a majority have venous compression. So if you do an MRA, which is the gold standard, an MR study of, in my view, of this disease, you don't need to do a physical exam. You know, all of those are equivocal. The key is you get to a point where the patient has no other reasons to have neurologic symptoms. You've ruled out various uh, spine issues, et cetera, et cetera. And someone's saying, hey, could this be TOS? You do the, the study. If the vein is compressed, you can fix that. And that's what the patient needs to know. And they want to know that you know 
what the problem is and you're going to deal with the problem instead of using surgery as this sort of a journey of discovery. In the minority of them, they have various problems in their neck. Those patients with neurologic symptoms should really be classified as cervical disease of one kind or another. And frankly, removing their first rib and so forth makes no difference in these patients. That's why we've kind of had muddied waters because we've done first rib for everybody. And in those patients, the first rib and so forth should be left alone. And you go right after those bands that would be identified on the various radiologic studies. The arterial patients are pretty easy. Uh, this is usually a disease in the neck that's compressing the artery and you can deal with it. And, and then, as I said, the venous ones are relatively easy too. But in the venous ones, the key is go after the disease of the rib, not the whole thing, because by taking out the whole rib, you end up causing more complications. Um, basically, the, the key is this is a paper that just came out and uh, in the Journal of Thoracic Disease that kind of tells you the whole story as I have put it. And, and uh, um, if anyone's interested in the surgical aspects, there is a technique paper that just was published of how to do it. This is a hot topic among thoracic surgeons who really have found uh, new excitement about TOS uh, because it feels good to help patients and not have to uh, talk them into the fact that they should be better and they're not. And uh, the, if just to show you, the, the, there are three little holes made. They're about uh, uh, half of an inch each, and the robot arms go through this. I won't show the robot operation uh, in this uh, discussion, but you can, if you Google my name and robotic first rib, you can see some videos on the web. And anyone who's interested in a more detailed discussion, uh, this is the textbook of robotic surgery. And there's a, there's a very extensive chapter on all aspects of this. So thank you very much for the privilege of presenting some of our thoughts and findings and studies. Uh, and I'm delighted to now um, engage with some questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fareed. Uh, as you know, TOS is a very controversial disease. And it's, uh, it's great that somebody has really put some thought into it to help see what we're missing and what we're getting. Uh, I want to start, go back to your talk where you talk about Pete. I want to read the quote that I pulled up while you were talking because I think it's fascinating. So hang on one second. I pulled up the quote. Yeah, so Pete, who was a physical therapist, he was still in training. He said this, the various terms for this syndrome have arisen from the numerous explanations of the underlying pathology. The etiologic aspects of this complex of neurovascular symptoms remains confusing because so many anatomic deviations in the structures of the neck and shoulder have been described. So he took this thing where he clearly said there's a ton of variability, and then he lumped it all together, which is what you said in a much more elegant way. Um, the success rates for TOS, you know, in different places, they've been up and down. Uh, I would point out the parallels to appendicitis. Uh, I always tell this story when I was a kid, I read a book about Harry Houdini dying from appendicitis. And I was scared as a kid that I would swallow a watermelon seed and get appendicitis and die. Um, you look historically, even very recently in the 1990s, uh, surgeons doing a clinical examination on patients were about 15% false positive and 15% false negative, meaning false positive for everybody who's listening, that a surgeon would go in thinking it was uh, appendicitis and the patient didn't have it. False negative, meaning that the surgeon felt the patient didn't have appendicitis, but in fact, the patient did. So that 15% is pretty parallel to TOS. Uh, the outcomes from all the biggest names in the field, the names who publish the most, I guess, they'll say that at uh, you know one year or shortly after surgery, they have 85% success rate, but it drops off at two years to about 70% success rate. So clearly we've got a lot to learn. We don't have one answer. I'm curious about your thoughts about those numbers I just threw out. No, no, that is actually, I, I appreciate it and, and I totally agree with you. You know, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, uh, you, you have to walk in the shoes of a surgeon. And in, and I say that as, you know, as one who, who has, uh, uh, the same sort of emotional aspects that go with, with all surgeons. 
you know, we do some intervention to a person. Obviously, every surgeon means well. They want the best. But then there is this human thing, this filter that gets in there where we try to talk ourselves and our patient into the fact that it should be a success. You know, the word should should never enter this discussion. It's either successful or it's not. Should be is is garbage, frankly, from my standpoint. Because should be is trying to tell somebody what it should be, and it's not. And and it's a fascinating thing that that I think that if you look at this, uh, the patients are not well after surgery, and this concept that after a period of time the curve gets worse and the, right. is is nonsensical. What it is, it's a it's the psychology. You know, I mean, a patient who has surgery wants to feel better. And they do, you know, it's interesting. We did a study where many years ago um, with a colleague, a vascular surgeon, where we divided the first rib only. So we went over the clavicle and just divided the rib, nothing else, in patients who had nerve symptom. And they got some be somewhat better because the compression got less. And so the issue is, um, if you do something to the first rib, the patient will improve some to some extent, but they will never be perfect. And that's that's really needs to be the bar, not the improvement. The other aspect is, unfortunately, um, for scientists, and again, I'm not trying to like this surgeons or anything. It's just this is human. You know, we're all human. We we have we are a plus personalities and we never want to say what if the, everything I learned in my whole career is not true? <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the tough part. Uh, that I think that that's the, the part where you need to step back and say, wow, if you're doing something and it really doesn't have the same results as you would expect, time to regroup. And so we know that patients do respond at first in large number to the traditional approach, which you've done in the past, yeah. but that there's this recurrence of symptoms. So it could be a placebo effect. There could also be a physiologic change that occurs over time. There's a lot we don't know about this disease. That's why a pioneering new approach it opens up so many, well, it opens up good things, but it opens up questions too, right? So, well, I, I think I also have to underline an important thing because i think we i just recently had a patient so so the history the exam all of the things that we've relied on really are not very accurate and we all know that but we still keep doing it so re the key is i'm i believe that the mr study that is done of the neck and the shoulder and so forth and someone like you is obviously the world's expert and you can talk about that a lot more than me, is the thing that the surgeon needs to hang his hat on. So recently, I, I had a patient, for all the world, I thought, absolutely, this is TOS. You know, there's the symptoms, everything. The MR study is done, and there is nothing there for me to deal with. This is the tough thing, because at that point, historically, we have said, well, you're miserable, I can't guarantee the surgery will be successful, but I'm going to do it so that maybe it'll be successful. Yeah. That is the wrong thinking. Yep. That yep. is wrong. And so that's when you st you walk away because there, th 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 there are other things that can cause the, the, that constellation of symptoms. Well, well, you brought it up. By bringing up Pete and discussing the history, Fareed, you've laid out how this is really a more complex disease than just one syndrome. And there's not one treatment right? Yeah. It's going to work for everybody because we don't, we don't have a gold standard for diagnosis yet, do we? No, but I think that uh, after you, you go through the algorithm of figuring out the more common things that could be causing the problems, again, mm -hmm. the paget Schroeder's are easy, the arterial is easy, it's the neurogenic or neurologic symptom. In those patients, I think the MR, at least in my estimation, allows us to Again, a surgeon has a different view than a diagnostician. For me, what's important is to know who I can help and who I can't help. Because you can't have a 50-50 uh, result with surgery. That's, that's ridiculous, right? 
Right. And so, so from a surgeon's standpoint, the surgery should be done on a specific pathologic problem. And if it's not there, no surgery. End of the story. Somebody else needs to figure out what's going on. So uh, we have a bunch of comments on, on um, YouTube that are showing up and people who are bringing up the standards and reporting of the, uh, I guess, the establishment approach, um, something I've taken issue with before. Um, uh, I'll say a couple things and then I want to spur on uh, your opinion on this. The approach has been, if you look at uh, standards that came out of the core TOS program, which I was a part of, everybody who's watching, I was on the steering committee. We had a huge multi-center national trial for TOS. We applied to the NIH, and in the end, uh, it was rejected partly because we didn't use any modern techniques or imaging. But those people have gone on and created five categories, and if you get one of something in each of those five categories, they consider it TOS. But the five categories are things like numbness in your arm or having an occupation where your arms are over your head. It's just completely nonspecific. So the, uh, the Society for Vascular Surgery, SVS, I've spoken at one of their national meetings. Uh, they have basically established reasonable criteria for arterial or venous TOS. As you said, those are easy to diagnose. But for neurogenic, they basically emphasize a cervical rib and then no other type of imaging. So a chest X-ray or cervical spine X-ray. And then everything else is based on this constellation of symptoms with this kind of addition, you have to trust me, I've seen it, I've done it, so I know it when I see it. What, what are your feelings on that as an well, approach to I mean, society? I think that, uh, again, uh, physicians, surgeons, et cetera, anyone in medicine, the reason we do what we do is to help people. So we come in with good intentions, but good intention is not enough. That is not enough. It, uh, it, we're also scientists. So I understand what our societies are doing, but our, and, and I, you know, we're all part of it. You know, we're living in the same world, but I think that it is important as scientists to say, uh, you know, we're doing our best, but this is not perfect. And we need to look for new things. And, and again, we have come to, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. Let me just sort of use an analogy. You know, when I was a medical student and probably when you, uh, we spend a lot of time with a thing in our ears, listening to patients' hearts and talking about murmurs and valve disease and stuff like that. Today, just a few decades later, nobody walks around listening to hearts because you have the technology that's going to tell you definitively what's going on. You know, you do a scan, you do a, a TEE, a, a, a echo, whatever. So this is the same with TOS. We are walking around with ear, you know, things in our ears and trying to make sense out of some sounds and then operating on people based on these sounds, which is ridiculous, which is the symptom, you know, the five symptoms. So the issue is we need to get more sophisticated. That doesn't mean what we have done is wrong. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. our, our surgeons and others are doing it wrong. Nobody is pointing fingers, but I think that what we do need to understand is there's frustration. Our patients are frustrated, the surgeons are frustrated, the diagnosticians are frustrated. So that's where the place to start and to say, we can do better, simple as that. And, and you know, I mean, how many times somebody would operate on a mitral valve in the 1980s, find out that there's nothing going on. Yep. That was a common finding that, hey, the murmur we heard was not real but it's very different. That number has decreased significantly. I, I have an uncle who was a pediatric cardiologist for years, what he called the golden age. And it, just as you said, the stethoscope was the answer, but he was smart enough that when TE or echocardiography came along, he thought it was a boon and not that he was gonna lose his value because the stethoscope was losing its value. So yes. you, you brought up MRI and I just yes. wanna add in here that I don't believe that the MRI is 100% of the answer either. It needs to be this combination with the clinical judgment and everything else. And that's just because the nature of this neurologic TOS is just so difficult. It's Absolutely. Not Again, I think it's an algorithm. You have to sort of follow an algorithm. Hmm. And, and you need to, so TOS usually turns out to be a diagnosis of exclusion because you've made the easier diagnosis. 
And then again, MR is not the final thing, but the MR is important for the surgeon, more so for the diagnostician. Because if the MR doesn't show a surgically correctable problem, you should not operate. End of the story. And it's sort of like, you know, again, using analogy, because, you know, our audience is not all physicians. But there, when I was a resident in surgery, uh, you talked about appendicitis. We, there was a certain percentage of patients we would do an exploratory operation on, and they had a normal appendix. And that we patted ourselves on the back saying, that means right. you're not missing the bad ones, right? right? Right. But which, that was the state of the art then. But, you know, right now, this is not how you make a diagnosis of appendicitis. Right. And right? CT, CT came along, and now we're at 3%, you know. There we go, instead of 15%, right. instead of 20 And this is where we are with TOS. Yeah. We, we need to sort of right. uh, basically uh, forget about the old ideas the diagrams that I showed you, which unfortunately are, is difficult. We need to start thinking outside the box and we need to start thinking about uh, newer modalities for diagnosis. And that's, that's it. And, and you know, the, it, the fascinating thing again to me is that, um, you know, everyone, for example, talks about an Atzen test, but nobody talks about a right test. And it's fascinating that the, uh, Dr. Wright, when he talked about his test back in the 40s, uh, he was talking about uh, venous ischemia. He was talking about the stuff. So we are rediscovering these mm -hmm. things that got buried in history. Yep. And so it is important to understand that we cannot be doing the same diagnostic thing that we did in 1920 and 1930 and 1940, that we need to be more sophisticated. Yep. Uh, Irving Wright was, uh, he was a pioneer in many ways. And his test was different than Adson's test. It was different than the test that Waddell did on military recruits in 1943. It was different than Eden's test, the costoclavicular test. All these tests and all these different syndromes got rolled into one by Pete. And yes. that's something I believe we are deconstructing. That's why you presented two different forms of the disease right now. Yes, absolutely. See, that's the other thing that if, for a disease that is seen so rarely by the usual practitioner, uh, uh, there's so much talk about this disease, very little action about this disease. And I think that uh, th that is the unfortunate thing. I think one of the other things I would say is for the patients and other, our colleagues, if you're not doing a lot of this, uh, if you're not seeing a lot of patients with TOS or, or you're not in a center where they see a lot of patients, get out because that's an important point that, you know, we've learned that in many areas in medicine where you need to have a lot of experience clinically to get good results. So I think that that's part of the problem too, because people may do one or two operations a year. And frankly, those are not gonna have good results. And, uh, and if there's a patient who is suspected of POS, they need to go to centers and there are many around the world where there's a lot of experience because the, it is more important for a surgeon to tell you that you shouldn't have surgery versus you should have surgery. That's the key. How many do, does your center do in a year? How many have you done in the past several years? We uh, do something over a hundred a year. Wow. And, and so it's become very, very uh, uh, common because people come from all over. But one of the important things is that um, Again, we are very selective, right? I mean, that's is key. If you're doing sort of surgery based on symptoms like we were talking about, the results are not going to be good. And then uh, patients are not going to come. And then you as a surgeon lose interest also because mm -hmm. who wants to do an operation and or hold their breath and hope that it works? That doesn't right. make sense. And so we are in a very, very complex lucky. anatomic area. Yes, yes. So we've been very lucky to, 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 for that. and. And then, of course, uh, and, and uh, you know, hopefully it'll get even better. Let me ask you a couple of patient questions here. Uh, one person said, um, some physicians in this series have discussed abnormal scapular position as part of TOS. Could you discuss scapular position in relation to your view that the rib joint is a key concept? Yes. Uh, apples and oranges, I would say. So this, definitely you can have symptoms in the upper extremity because you have an abnormal scapular position. But that 
I'm not sure would go along with our understanding of first rib and all of this stuff. So in those patients, frankly, uh, again, as you said, this is a group of problems that all manifest with extremity symptoms. So we need to sort of clear the waters and understand that a scapular position is not to be underplayed or dismissed, but it needs something more than surgery can do, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really the key or other orthopedic things that I don't know anything about. But I cannot say that scapular position. Now, I will say one thing. Patients that in my experience, and again, we're lucky to have a lot of patients. Um, and, you know, we started with maybe a handful a year and now we have many, many more. They will have symptoms that may not make sense to me. So, so I can imagine someone with ischemia of the upper extremity because the subclavian drain drains the scapular area, the side of the neck and the arm, and this whole area of the chest. You can have a feeling that there's something wrong with your scapula because of the ischemia issue. And someone who is not looking at the ischemia may say, oh, it's your scapular position, but it's really that proprioceptive aspect of your neurologic symptoms. Uh, uh, condition where you're saying this doesn't feel right. We see that a lot. So if you are thinking that he has a problem with a scapular position that and that diagnosis is made by somebody getting a study of the subclavian vein or getting an MR of the thoracic outlet, you know, that type of thing would be a very good idea because it may not be that the scapular is not in the right position. It may be that it doesn't feel right because it's not getting the right blood flow. So we may have two populations of patients, one with the TOS due to the abnormal positioning of the whole shoulder girdle, separate ones who are ischemic or congested because of the vein compression. Yes. Yep. And you need to separate them, right? And right. that's key. So, and, so yeah. And Stephen, who asked the question, I want to point out, if you go back and look at our anatomy studies, please recall that the shoulder blade is attached by 17 different muscles, but in the end, it's only attached to the chest wall right here, which is Dr. G's area of concern. So yeah. abnormal position of the scapula may bring the first rib and this part of the collarbone too close together, which may result in this venous congestion. Absolutely. The one message I would have for all our colleagues and patients is physical exam and what people are feeling are not the best way to understand what's going on. You need objective pictures yep. of and what's very, going very on. Very complicated anatomy, right? Yeah, you really need that. Let me find. There's another question here. Uh, let me pull it up here. Um, and, uh, hold on. I know I saw it here. I'm going to go back. Bear with me. Okay, uh, James, who we know, said. I thought removal of the whole rib was necessary because it grows back. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Sure, sure. Um, I, I don't blame you for thinking that. The issue is that the rib doesn't grow back. That's been one of the issues that has been sort of uh, uh, in, the, in our world of TOS for many, many years. It's, it's a funny thing. When a patient gets better and then they, they, they symptoms come back, somebody starts talking about how the rib grew back or, you know, this is recurrent disease or and so forth. The, the, if the rib is removed, the periosteum is removed with the rib, and if there is no periosteum, the rib will not grow back. The issue is we the removing of the first rib historically for our colleagues came about, and Dr. Verdan knows about this better than, more than me, but it came about when uh, I believe the first one was done in Australia, where somebody was going after a cervical rib in a patient who had symptoms, and they erroneously, uh, or whatever happened, they removed the first rib and the patient got better. And then they're like, okay, first rib how it plays a role in all this. And then we have taken the first rib in all the patients. Now that we're understanding that in this subset of patients, the disease, we call it the offending portion of the first rib. The disease is on the medial aspect where the rib joins with the sternum. Removing the rest of the rib does not make sense. And frankly, the back of the rib is where it articulates with the spine is where the sympathetic chain is and many nerves. And if you look at the complications of TOS surgery, 
the majority of them are neurologic complications related to the disarticulation of the rib in the back. So given that, we actually have an ongoing study um, looking at what's the difference between taking out the whole rib and the like half of it and uh, the, or the offending portion. Seems that the symptoms get relieved either way, but the, removing the whole rib has complications. So that is, that is sort of one of the historic things that we are trying to change. Uh, but everybody thinks that the first rib should be removed. And that is not true. I had a person ask me a question here, Farid, about the standards. Um, they, they uh, I'll see if I can read it. It's, I'll read it more nicely than it's written. Uh, let me see if I can find it here, bear with me. Um, they, they said, you don't know what the standards are. They're very specific. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the thing that I just referred to. Bear with me for a second. Share screen. I'm going to select the window or screen I want to share. Okay. And I'm going to pull up this right here. Can you see the text here, Fareed? Yes. Okay. So core TOS, which I have been involved in. This is the clinical diagnostic criteria for neurogenic TOS. And they say the patient has to have at least one of these four of the five categories. But take a look at this, you know, pain in the neck, back, shoulder, numbness and paresthesia. I mean, those things are very, very nonspecific. And yeah. then, you know, pain, paresthesia exacerbated by elevated arm position or repetitive arm and hand use. Again, this is pretty nonspecific. Uh, that there's a history of occupational or recreational injury. This is nonspecific. That there's been a previous clavicle or first rib fracture. I mean, that's such a small part of any. I've, I've done thousands of cases of MRIs now, and I've seen two cases of clavicle fractures. It's just very rare. Yeah. Um, a cervical rib. But cervical rib is, you know, Easy. you never know what it's pressing on. It's useless by x-rays. Um, for physical examination, local tenderness on palpation or paresthesias on palpation, you know, and then finally provocative measures, at least a little bit, but these tests have been shown to be pretty so-so. And even if they diagnose TOS, they don't teach you the underlying pathology. So, so one person, thank you for the comment about the standards, but this is just an example of how we have diagnostic criteria for our listeners that just are not specific. And even if they did make the diagnosis, it wouldn't show you where the pathology is. Pete, the guy who came up with the term TOS, said there's a million different variants here, okay? And this kind of criteria or establishment of a standard doesn't separate out any of those. So my little soapbox, I'm curious if you have any comments on this. Oh yeah, so, so let me, let me uh, give you my, my uh, two cents on that. You have to be careful about words, and this is to our you know, viewer. You, those are criteria for diagnosing clinical diagnosis of TOS. And I totally agree with everything that you just said, because those are the ways the patients will present. So that's the criteria for clinically diagnosing thoracic Allis syndrome. That is absolutely true. That is not a standard. Standard, standard of care, standard of this, that's a legal term. So it's very important to understand you know, these words and what they mean and how you apply them. The fact that there is clinical criteria for diagnosis of TOS does not mean that, as Dr. Verdan said, and I agree, you know what's causing those symptoms. Those are just the starting point, not the end point. So this is very important to understand that we, I am not at all in disagreement with any other cl clinical criteria. And uh, what we're saying is we want to go further down the road to take those symptoms that we think someone has TOS because of those criteria and understand why they have those symptoms. And then the next step is how can a surgical procedure correct that problem? So I would caution people using standards and words like that, because that's not the purpose of that document that you showed. Um, and I'm going to show you one more thing because you're bringing up an important criterion here. So there are reporting standards from the Society for Vascular Surgery. And I'll just bring those up briefly because they're fairly extensive. But 
let me bring this up here. I'm sure you've seen it before. This is from 2016. Uh, these docs at the top, Dr. Illy, Donahue, Freischlag, Gelliber. I've worked with many of these docs and been involved with them discussing these things. But uh, their classification here and standards for neurogenic TOS, okay, um, people can look it up. You saw the title before. It just doesn't, um, you know, it's a longer paper. I don't want to show you the whole thing, but it basically includes for neurogenic TOS that imaging is that you would just do a chest x-ray. I'll see if I can find it in here. But it, it has many of the same things that we just discussed, that there are peripheral symptoms and that they're worse when you raise your arms and that you have an occupational history. You know, by itself, again, my chief concern is that that doesn't show the underlying pathology. And there is plenty of research out there that says that a ruse test or an upper limb neural tension test just doesn't have sensitivity or sensitivity. Well, I mean, again, the, 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 the one thing people, our patients need to understand is that these papers that we write are not meant to, when they're talking reporting standards, that is for scientific purposes of mm -hmm. tabulating patients and what, you know, this is a way to learn. It, so they're at telling people, these are the people that we will include in our database, et cetera. That is a different definition of a standard to, to what's the standard of care for something, et cetera, et cetera. So you gotta be careful with the use of the word. The so second then, point, sorry. and that's really important. The second point about that I would make is that uh, the, the science of, of medicine is evolving. So standards that are in 2016 are not necessarily things or, or criteria change as our research changes. You know, I mean, there was a time I would tell this to our audience. There was a, when I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins, I spent a whole year looking at the lining of the stomachs of patients who had ulcer disease. And I was looking to see what was wrong with the lining because the idea then, the standard then, was acid was causing ulcers in the stomach. Two guys from Australia, about six years later, found that everything I spent my time on and all the papers we wrote at Johns Hopkins was garbage <laughs> because it was not acid, but it was bacteria. So the issue is medicine changes and that is beautiful. And so it is very important to, to put this in perspective. And unfortunately, these days, when we're sort of doing this mass discussions and so forth with people with different understanding of the field, uh, you can get some confusion. And the worst thing would be for patients to get confused about when we're talking about scientific method and translate that into clinical practice. So in your opinion, at the present day, do we have a clinical diagnosis that's accurate for neurogenic or neurologic TOS? No, no. I think we are able to say this is likely to be TOS based on all the things that we, you know, you showed, but that likely does not mean to someone like me who's doing the surgery or someone like the patient who's having the surgery that they should have surgery. So the key is we all agree that after you ruled out everything that's common and so forth, we're understanding that this is a chameleon, as we said, it presents in different ways. Actually, that's m more evidence for the fact that this is blood flow related rather than specific nerve related in a lot of patients, because that's how it is with blood flow. But we need to be paying attention to the next steps of diagnosing it objectively with something you can see and the surgery, you know, after all, a surgical strike is supposed to be a very accurate, focused approach to a problem. So we need to pay more attention to that. And unfortunately, that's where we fall flat on our face. In my view, this is one man's opinion in this field when it comes to the surgeons, because we keep doing the same thing right. and expect different results. And we've got 15 to 30 percent of people who aren't better after two years. At, and that is being optimistic, to be frank with you. You know, I mean, after 30 years of doing this, I can tell you that when I did the conventional operations and back in the 90s, uh, I, I would get ulcers thinking about it because, frankly, it, if only 15% of the patients didn't get better, uh, 
um, I would have been happy, but it's not that way. It's, it's a larger. Now, th I think some of the, the reason we have these standards is to try to clean the data to really understand, is it 15% or is it more? And we're just saying it's 15%, you know? So it's very important to, to again, as scientists, to apply the scientific method mm -hmm. and understand that until you have data and until you know what's going on, guesswork does not belong. So having standards is good because then if you use them properly, you can say, look, they held up or they didn't hold up. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and right now, I don't think from my reading of the literature that we're happy, that everybody's happy with the percentage that we get correct. No, and, and uh, the, again, the issue really, I totally agree with you. I think that TOS in the next few decades will be very different than in the past. And some of that is really um, people, people get older, you know, they're preconceptions kind of go away with them, new people, new blood comps, new thinking. That's the other thing. Because this is not a commonly seen, even though it's a lot of patients, is not commonly done by most practitioners, then we sort of get blinders on. We really do. And, and I think that's one of the problems in, in medicine, that uh, whether it's me or anybody else, we sort of start thinking that what we are saying is gospel. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, rabbit hole you shouldn't climb into. Right. I like the story about the H. pylori, the bacteria that was really causing the ulcers in the stomach. And think of how it's changed. You go into an ER and you get a breath test now. But but the important is. point is that those two physicians, one a gastroenterologist, the other pathologist, hmm. they could not get their papers published for a decade. Right. They, they were saying because people didn't believe them, including people like me. And for a decade, they couldn't publish their papers. Finally, they get it in somewhere and people start saying, wow, you know, maybe this is a different idea. And then we come around another decade later and give them the Nobel Prize in medicine. So you see, that is the nature of medicine. Just because the experts of the time think something, it does not mean it's the truth. It means it's the understanding of the time. And so medicine needs to go forward. So there are docs you probably work with out there or you interact with who are somewhat critical of uh, robotic surgery for this application. Yes. Well, to be honest with you, they're not critical. The problem with TOS, let me, let me tell this to the audience, is robotic surgery can only be done through the chest by thoracic surgeons. The majority of surgeons who do TOS surgery are vascular surgeons. You just showed papers in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. That's a problem because a vascular surgeon that can do certain things and not other things. So that one of the problems we're having is coming to grips with the fact that we think that there's a certain approach which is the best for our patient, but the majority of, we, by doing, saying that, we're kind of pushing certain people out of the way. So I think that as time goes on, and I believe there will be a time when robots can be used by all surgeons you know this is being a vascular surgeon a thoracic surgeon is a is an artificial boundary the robot gets rid of these boundaries and uh, and then uh, you become a robotic surgeon whether it's one thing or another so so the issue is that i think in time uh, we find but the fascinating thing is in our institution people don't do first rib resections no vascular surgeon would do first rib resection because Surgeons have intellectual honesty. They can see that if the operation is better done in a certain way and they're doing five a year, they will shift them over there. And that's what's happened. And that makes me so happy to see. It's like me, if, you know, I'm a thoracic surgeon, but, but I don't do mesothelioma surgery. So the intellectually honest thoracic surgeon would say, I will send you to someone who does this better than I do even though I can do it. That's important. That's the piece that, that's, that has to be said. Another question from a patient, Stephen, asked, could vascular compression that bothers the nerves be synergistic with the nerve crush somewhere else, analogous to the double crush concept? To be honest, I'm not sure what, what the question 
is maybe if you understand it, you can explain it to me. I'm not sure what what I that think means. What's, and, and Steve, you could clarify it if you want. I think he's saying vascular compression combined with nerve compression. Could that be synergistic? Well, there would be two different problems, right? And I think that's possible. The more likely thing that we have found is in patients where we who have had TOS surgery, however you did it, there are certain group of patients who don't get better. And we think that the surgery failed, but it really didn't fail. In my view, uh, in, we, and in my practice, when, when in the old days when we would have such things, um, we would have them see a, a, a neurologist, a central nervous system neurologist, because nerve symptoms don't have to be all from stuff in the thoracic outlet. And there are a number of these patients actually had demyelinating disease. They had all kinds of things that that you would say was a failure of the surgery, but there were two different things, or maybe it was all that one thing, and we think it's something else. So it's very important to um, understand that it's not always the failure of surgery. Sometimes it's failure of diagnosis. So, Stephen, if I could add my two cents in here from the patients that I see, which may be a different population to some extent than what Dr. G sees. I see a, a good amount of mechanical compression, but my reports always include descriptions of in detail what Dr. G is talking about. Do we have venous compression? Um, the, for instance, the paper that uh, you sent me about the, the dog study where they banded the aorta or the inferior vena cava, it basically showed that even with the low pressure veins being obstructed, there was early damage to the ganglia around the lumbar spine, that the, the leakage of fluid from the blood vessels into the nerves was surprisingly higher with the vein compression, very low pressure, versus arterial compression, which is very high pressure. So two different mechanisms happen in those nerves. So I suspect, you already described at least two different sy syndromes, but I suspect that patients with mechanical compression, some of them do have an element of your primary diagnosis of venous compression, which makes it worse. We'll see over time yeah. how that shakes out. But you no, know. I agree. I think that it is, again, I will go back and we may not have the perfect study, but we do need objective studies to lead our decision making. It cannot be that it's a, di you know, surgery is based on a diagnosis of ex exclusion. That is not sensible. Right. right. That's important. And that, that bothers me too when people talk about TOS. I think there are certainly patients where we can make a positive diagnosis, the combination of imaging, clinical judgment, and maneuvers. I, I think we can clearly make positive diagnosis in at least some of these patients. So yes. I, I think that's of great value. Uh, let's see if I have any other questions. Well, you know, um, I did take note on something I wanted to bring up. Bear with me one second. I was listening to your talk. Yeah, you talked about venous compression in the lower extremities. So uh, you're not the first one to bring that up, interestingly. I had a doc from New York who, uh, he, he works with a vascular surgeon who takes care of May-Turner syndrome, which Ooh. is where the veins, right, cross over in the legs, in the pelvis, and the left leg tends not to drain very easily. And this surgeon swears that patients get thoracic outlet syndrome-like symptoms of the leg, just as you described. So it's nice Absolutely. to hear Absolutely. You know, it is interesting that when you talk about crossing your leg, people think it's because you're pressing on a popliteal nerve, and it's not. Right. And it is really compression of the of the popliteal vein right. in these patients. Well, and, and it, could, it could be two things. And just because people have one explanation doesn't mean to stop looking for another one. No, that's true. The, the only thing is, to, to be honest, uh, the majority of times, you know, you cr uncross your leg, um, uh, it, the symptoms get better in a Fast. gradual way, right? And right. that's usually more a flow rather than a, you know, a, a direct compression of a nerve. But at any rate, the issue is, I think that that, that your colleague is, is onto something. In fact, I think Dr. Wright of the Wright test was onto that. He was interested in that almost 80 years ago or whatever, yep. 100 years ago, whatever. But the, so, so yes, I think the other thing I want to underline is our concepts are surgical concepts. This is important for the audience. So I have a very skewed view of the world of TOS. So if there are 100 patients with TOS, I will see a small percentage of them because 
I will only see operate on patients who have what I believe we can fix. That does not mean the other people don't have TOS. They have it for other things. So it's very important to understand that as well. You, one remedy does not fit all, and uh, but and that's key. Going back to your original history about Pete lumping everything together, that's right. I think we need to deconstruct some of this and find those differences between patients. Yes. So it, it's yes. great that you've added another tool to our, our set of tools for this. My pleasure. No, this is this is very exciting, and, and I think that we're going to find that uh, with this thinking, we're actually going to help patients. The, the thing that is really very distressing to me uh, is when I see a young lady who has been talking about symptoms that are kind of, you know, along those lines that we discussed, but they're not really specific enough. And our colleagues, because they don't understand it in terms of a specific nerve involvement, dismiss it. And these people are either psychologically affected by people not believing them, sure. or they end up with, you know, pain medications on and on and on and on, which is terrible. So, so I think, you know, that that's, uh, so it is pleasing to see that we can help those patients. And the, the beginning point is to believe them and not just dismiss their symptoms. So to all our viewers, uh, toseducation.org is intended to share all kinds of viewpoints, new and old. And I think Dr. G has given us a tremendous amount of depth into his reasoning, into the history of TOS, into the current state of TOS and where he's going with it. And I, I think that that's, that's really greatly appreciated. You've spurred a lot of conversation. Uh, that kind of stimulation will make people think critically and, and really carefully. And I think it's a huge value for our community. So I thank you personally. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the privilege of uh, discussing it with you. Thank you. We're very happy. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. And uh, anybody who wants to see our next talks that are upcoming, please go to toseducation.org. You can view this video as well as our other ones. And if you go to my personal website, tosmri.com, we keep the same library of videos. And uh, thanks, Fareed, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And you always leave me thinking so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.